And, and what has your research uncovered in terms of why the Russians imprisoned him and why did they deny everything? What, what's, what did your research uncover in terms of the story behind the story? His destiny there is so tragic uh, and it's a huge question. <laughs> I normally say that I'm not surprised that they arrested him after all. You had this Swedish diplomat, uh, I, as I told you about the, these Cold War feelings going on in Moscow. You had a diplomat with an American mission that was suspicious. You had a diplomat whose relatives had been active in those separate peace negotiations that Stalin was so angry about. Another suspicion, he bore the same name as Marcus and Jakob Wallenberg, who were messengers between the, 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 the Germans, uh, the, uh, the Germans and the, the Western allies here. And uh, you also had the fact that uh, his relatives were those cap capitalists. Wallenberg was part of a capitalist family and that was not good, for, of course, for his situation. And then you had his behavior in Budapest. Of course, he had contacts with Eichmann, with Nazis, with the arrow crossers. They regarded him as a spy. We don't know why they arrested him. All we know is that uh, he, uh, what he told his uh, co-prisoners when he came back from the first interrogation, then they had told him that they knew he was a member of a capitalist family, one, two, that he was a spy, two. Uh, two. So, uh, um, that's, that's the background for the, uh, the arrest. My uh, biggest question and that I still don't have an answer to is why he wasn't set free. So, uh, and to answer when, that when, question, when did the I efforts, think... when did the efforts begin once um, Swedish authorities, the family, um, his colleagues in Budapest realized that he was a prisoner, what efforts initially took place to try to con get contact with him and attempt to free him from Moscow? Unfortunately, they didn't understand, at least not the, the, the Swedish government uh, and not enough uh, of his uh, uh, collaborators or colleagues in Budapest either, that he was a prisoner. And that is due to uh, the huge Soviet disinformation campaign that took, uh, took off quite soon after his arrest, like in March 1945. I always say that uh, you can divide rather the, the whole story, post-war story on Raoul Wallenberg in two periods. One period is when the, the Russians told the truth about Raoul Wallenberg. And the second part is when they started to lie. Uh, and the first part is about a month or a half, one and a half. And the second part now is long above 70 years because they still lie about what happened during this whole post-war period. So you asked about when they started to act. Uh, of course, the family started to act immediately, but because of this disinformation campaign that was planted Lies were planted in, for example, at Hungarian radio stations and at diplomatic uh, parties in Budapest and in uh, other cities already in March 1945, that Raoul Wallenberg, in fact, was not taken care of by Russian troops. He had died either during a, a, a rocket attack or during a, a car accident in Budapest. So what happened was, and the, the most unfortunate of all that happened was that the Swedish diplomats returning from Budapest believed that story. And I think that you can say quite safely, and I know from notes taken, that during the spring 1945, this was the uh, informal truth in the corridors of the foreign ministry in Stockholm. And they acted after this uh, conviction that he was dead and and they did and they continued to do you could say so this was a, a real clash with a family who needed 
evidence, of course, and who, who were sure that uh, no, 